seek, and set. Yeah, those four great things, that, that outlet came together. I've got four points. The first two are the message, and then I'm going to make two points of application. We're going to talk about redemption. We're going to talk about riches. Then we're going to reaffirm the foundation, and then we're going to renew the issue of ministry out of Romans chapter number 3 here. And uh, the basics of grace. Now, Richard has been using the popular acronym GRACE, God's Riches at Christ's Expense. That's not the title in the program. The title in the program is Grace Riches at Christ's Expense. Either one's pretty good. But um, this, this evening, I want to talk to you about some of the foundational things. I appreciated what Rick did on Saturday night. That is, the issue, we're, not, we're going to be going, we're going over some basic things, some basic foundational issues. And while it's nothing new, what was the issue? Renewed hope and, or renewed mind and renewed hope. You know, th- th- we should have things in our thinking that are already stable and all, all you know, in our, clearly in our frame of reference to refer to, to renew our mind, to take and go back to the basic things and the, the foundational issues here in Romans chapter number 3 are, are no exception. So we're going to talk about, about those things. Romans chapter 3, Romans chapter 3, let's begin with um, verse 21 through 24. Just follow along with me. We'll have a word of prayer. But now... The righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Father, we thank You for this opportunity to look into Your Word. We thank You for this week, for all those that have labored to put the Uh, the program together, the facilities and the ministries and the activities behind the scenes. And we just pray that as we look into your word this evening that these things would, again, renew our minds, refresh our our hearts, and renew our commitment to uh, to the great privilege of being ambassadors for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Romans chapter 3, the first of, of the, 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 foundational, the, the foundational epistle of, of Paul's 13 epistles in the New Testament. And Romans lays the foundation, those four stones of salvation by grace, sanctification by grace, the dispensation of grace, and the application of grace. And as Paul begins to lay the foundation, you always got to have a good foundation. You always need to have some things established and settled, don't you? And those things will settle issues down the road if your foundation is right. And the Apostle Paul lays down the the details of his gospel. And of course, go back to Romans chapter number 1. Romans chapter number 1. Before, after the introduction to the book, in verses 1 through 12, he begins to give the the exhortation about why he uh, is writing the epistle. And that great statement in verse number 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I I love that verse. The power is in the gospel. And the power is in the gospel to them that believe it to change their eternal destiny. And the gospel works. Aren't you glad the gospel works? The gospel, the gospel works. This room is full of people that's evident that the gospel works. And we go out of here, we go away from here this weekend, uh, uh, this week, and go out and we're going to rub shoulders with people that need this message just like you did before you heard it. And these foundational truths are just vital. And the Apostle Paul is going to be dealing with the basics of how a righteous and a holy and a just God can justify, declare righteous, and, and then bless with abundance of eternal position in Jesus Christ uh, uh, an individual, a son of Adam that was, uh, that was lost and on the way to a Christless eternity can stand before the divine bar of justice accepted in the beloved and blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places throughout all the ages to come. What a great transformation that is. And the foundation is here. And as Paul lays the foundation, the first issue is the righteousness of God and the wrath of God revealed in the gospel. And in chapter number 1, verses 17, all the way to chapter 3 and verse 20, the issue is the guilt and the sin of man. 
chapter number one. It's the guilt and, and the, 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 the guilt and the inexcusableness and the accountability of the Gentiles. And then in chapter two, it's the, the accountability and the guilt of the Jew. And then chapter three, the whole world is guilty. And Paul has made his case before the divine bar of justice. And you have all of these things in Romans two and about, about the attributes of God, the righteousness of God and the truth of God and the long suffering of God and the mercy of God. All of these attributes that he has and the great truth about the righteousness of God, God is always going to do what's right. He's not going to violate his standard of right and wrong as he, as he demonstrates and executes his plan and his purpose. And you go all the way through the issue of, of the, the, the guilt of man and Paul makes his case as though he's a prosecuting attorney. He says in Romans chapter 3 and verse 9, look at that with me. Romans chapter 3 verse 9, What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise, for we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are not too awfully bad. They're on their way up. You know, they started in the puddle and they're on their way to paradise, right? No. They're all under sin. And he makes, he says, I proved it. It's, it's, it's unarguable as he demonstrates from history and he demonstrates from the Word of God the history of the Gentiles and the nation of Israel and the righteousness of God. And he drops, dropped down to verse number 19. Now we know that whatsoever the law, things, the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become what? Guilty before a righteous and a holy and a just God. That's our plight. We stand as sons of Adam with a fallen human nature and a fallen human condition and we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the answer is going to be given in verses 21 through the, the end of the chapter to man's plight. But he says in verse number 20, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight for all have, um, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. The answer to man's sin problem and his guilt and his condition of unrighteousness before God is not going to be in a performance system. It's not going to be through the only religion that God gave to man back, in, back through, through Moses. The law program, the law can't do it. Then you come to those great two words in chapter 21, or chapter 3, verse 21. But now, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The law can't do it. And Paul has made his case. And as you, go out, as you go out as an ambassador for Jesus Christ and you begin to deal with lost people, the first issue is the issue of sin and man's problem before a righteous and a holy and a just God. And it's been rightly said, you have to get somebody lost. They, they have to realize that they need a Savior before they'll grab enthusiastically to the answer. Most people think they're okay. They're not as bad as so-and-so, and they're, they're doing the best they can. And especially in, in, in America and in Western civilization, there's always going to be somebody that are, that are further on down the food chain. And I have a little, little uh, acronym that I use as I, begin, as I start to talk to people because most people don't think they're a sinner. Most people don't realize the, they, they think of sin as just the real big stuff. But I, I have this little thing I call, you, when you're dealing with the issue of sin, you need to connect the dots. D-O-T-S, okay? And what is sin? Sin, number one, D, is the deeds. It's the things that you do. It's the, it's the failure to miss the mark and the, the acts that violate God's justice that, that demonstrate that we stand guilty and condemned. Sin is a transgression of the law, the deeds that we do. Sin is, is, is acts that violate the justice of God. O, sins of omission. Not doing what you're supposed to do. You know, sometimes you can sin just by not doing anything. You know, you get a driver's license. Every couple, three years, what do you have to do? You have to renew that driver's license. Well, I'm not going to do anything. 
You know, and, and you, by not doing anything, what do you wind up doing? You get pulled over. You've broken the law by not doing what you're supposed to do. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is. So there's, there's things that you do that violate God's justice, and then there's a failure to do the things that you ought to do. And uh, just by, by, by omission. D-O, deeds, omission. But then there's also sins of thought. The Bible says the thought of foolishness is what? Sin, covetousness, hate, envy, pride, all those things that go on inside. We, we, you know, you sin in your heart and in your mind. Thou shalt not covet. The law finds somebody guilty just by, by, the, by the attitudes that are there because of the, uh, because of the nation. So there's, there's sins of thought, hatred, envy, covetousness, pride. Then there's the issue of speech. Bearing false witness, telling a falsehood, slander, gossip. I know we never do that. We never say things about other people that we shouldn't say, do we? Yeah, okay, I know, I know. Connecting the dots. You go through that list and, and you ask somebody now, have you connected the dots in your life? Do you still want to say that you stand before a perfectly righteous and holy and a just God without sin in your life? And, you know, the old adage, the old three sins a day. Committing three sins a day, you know, people, most, most people do more than that, but you go more than three sins a day, you know, ah, oh, maybe ten, five, but only three sins a day. How many is that in a year? One thousand. How old are you? <laughs> Fill in the blank. <laughs> Fifty-eight. Fifty-eight thousand sins, conservatively speaking. I got a lot to give an answer for as I stand before a righteous and a holy and a just God, and we stand guilty, what's the answer? How is that uh, remedied? But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. The situation is, is that we have a God of absolute perfect righteousness who is just and is holy and is always going to do what's right, and he's never going to violate his perfect stand, uh, standard of righteousness. How can, can that God show riches of grace to a fallen man, to a sinner? How is that possible? How is that possible? A couple of illustrations about the justice of God. Come with me back to the, uh, to the book of Leviticus. Leviticus chapter number 24. Leviticus chapter number 24. God's justice always has to be satisfied. Leviticus chapter number 24. Proverbs 11 verse 1 says, A false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is His delight. God's justice, you always say the punishment has to fit the crime. And God's justice demands payment for sin. Leviticus chapter number 24, an example of the justice of God before uh, in the law itself. uh, Leviticus chapter 24, verse 17. And he that killeth any man shall surely be put to death. And he that killeth a beast shall make it good, beast for beast. By man, if man sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be what? Isn't that equal? Isn't that just and isn't that right and that equal? Beast for beast. And if a man, verse 19, cause a blemish in his neighbor as he hath done, so shall it be done to him. Breach for breach, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, as he hath caused a blemish in a man, so shall it be done to him again. And he that killeth a beast, he shall restore it. And he that killeth a man shall be put to death. And you shall have one manner of law as well for the stranger as one of your own country. For I am the Lord your God. Pretty, pretty righteous and pretty just. Pretty equally balanced, isn't it? The justice of God demands, and it cannot just overlook sin. Sin has to be paid for and sin has to be dealt with. And we all have a lot to to give an account for. Let's go to the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter number 19. Deuteronomy chapter 19 and verse 16. Deuteronomy chapter 19 and verse 16. An example of the righteousness and the justice of God in the law. If a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him, that which is wrong. 
Then both of the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord and before the priests, and the judges shall be in those days. And the judges shall make diligent inquisition. And behold, if the witness be a false witness and hath testified falsely against his brother, then ye sh- shall ye do unto him as he had thought to have done unto his brother. So shalt thou put away the evil from among you." That would, that would uh, eliminate false testimony, wouldn't it? For somebody to stand up on a, and, and swear to tell the whole truth and, and nothing but the truth in a court of law, and if he's going to testify falsely because he wants to avoid the punishment or he wants to have somebody punished unjustly and it's determined it's a false testimony, he gets the very same punishment. He just doesn't get a slap on the wrist. That's pretty just, isn't it? That's going to establish a righteous testimony. And, uh, and take care of the whole issue of false witness. God is just. And the whole world is guilty before God. And all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin, God's justice says, is what? Death. Not just physical death, but that second death, that issue of eternal separation from God. That's how serious the issue of sin is. And The the grace riches at Christ's expense, the the issue of of Christ's expense and and the, the, the problem that is solved through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. You're here in the book of Deuteronomy. Come with me to the book of Genesis. Rodney had mentioned the issue of redemption. We sing that song, Redeemed by the Blood of the Lamb. What a great Bible word that is. And and the very first occurrence of the word redemption is in Genesis chapter number 48. And as you, as you trace that word through the Old Testament, you, you develop and you get a definition of just what redemption is. And here you and I are. We stand before a righteous and a holy and a just God and we deserve the wages of our sin is death. But how is is the righteousness of God satisfied? It's through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. We rejoice in the great payment of Calvary and the finished work of of Jesus Christ on the cross and the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And redemption has the idea of of reaching and, and delivering somebody in jeopardy or somebody in peril or somebody in danger or somebody in an adverse situation. Genesis chapter 48. And talking about here, Jacob, as he's blessing Joseph's sons. Genesis 48, verse 16. The angel which redeemed me from what? All evil. Bless the lads. Redemption, first and foremost in the Bible, is complete and total. (coughs) Of course, we have redemption in the law program, but but the the law is types and it's a shadow of good things to, to what? To come. And the Lord Jesus Christ, when He hung on that cross, we sing that song, Jesus paid it all. The redemption that's in Christ Jesus, the payment for sin, is a total payment. But verse 16 goes on, The angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads, and let my name be named on them, and the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. Not only is it just redemption from out, from, and deliverance from evil, but it's also blessing. Blessing and favor and fruit and growth and multiplying. Redemption. Jesus Christ redeeming us from the plight and the, and the, and the, and the, the, the burdens of our sin and setting us free from, from the payment and the penalty of our sin and opening the door for blessing and, and, and fruit in our life and living a life that counts and, and amounts to something. The redemption is complete and total. Turn with me to, to Exodus chapter number 6. Exodus chapter number 6. Redemption is complete and total. Redemption is complete and total. Um, Exodus chapter number 6 and verse 6. Exodus chapter number 6 and verse 6 as um, the Lord is speaking unto Moses. Wherefore say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rid you out of their bondage. I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. Redemption is removal from bondage and, and burdens and the, and the weight of, of vigorous service there. Redeem you with a stretched out arm. There's the issue of power. 
and we see the picture of the redemption that's ours in Christ Jesus, the fundamental issue is the, the, the full and complete payment of that which, is, which has us in jeopardy against the justice of God, setting us free and setting us free from bondage and, and burdens. Isn't it wonderful to live life with joy in your heart? and not to, be, not to be weighted down and to be overcome. Brother Rick talked about that song the other night, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, Look Full in His Wonderful Face, and the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Attitude is everything. Your perspective about things. We get, we get overcome and we get, we, get, we, get, we get things that look so big. The, the way to overcome those things is have something that, that's bigger, that captivates your thinking that distracts from the downward pull of life and the burdens and, the, and the, the struggles. And our salvation does that. Redemption, the redemption that's in Christ Jesus, frees us from the, the bondage and the slavery of sin. Glorious freedom in Christ Jesus. Freedom and liberty from, from bondage and burdens. And of course, Exodus chapter number 13. Exodus chapter 13, this is all the farther we're going to go under this idea, but I just wanted to, to, to just talk a little bit about the issue of redemption. Exodus chapter number 13, verse 13, Every firstling of an ass shalt thou redeem with a lamb. And if thou wilt not redeem it, then thou shalt break his neck, and all the firstborn of man among thy children shalt thou redeem. Redemption is also by blood. All those things pointing, of course, to the, to the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ and the redemption. What's the answer to man's guilt and man's uh, lost and sinful condition? It's being justified freely by His grace through what? Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The payment has been made and God has fully been satisfied by the payment of His Son. And the, the issue of Christ's expense, Jesus Christ went to that cross and provided redemption for us and payment from all of the evil that we have committed and, and the, the setting us free from the bondage of an old sin nature and setting us free from the penalty of our sin and opens up the, the, the floodgates of God's grace and His goodness, the blessing that's ours in redemption. Go back to Romans chapter number 3. You have the, the fundamental issues of the gospel in Romans chapter number 3 as the Apostle Paul lays down the details of the but now gospel. Now we know that, the, that all the, the world is guilty before God and, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. The issue of grace, riches at Christ's expense I wanted to back up and look at the issue of Christ's expense. The, 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 the blessings that we enjoy of God's grace are free to us, aren't they? It's a free gift. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. It's free to us, but it cost Him everything. And the Lord Jesus Christ went to that cross and, uh, and satisfied the absolute perfect righteousness and justice in paying for your sin and mine. That's why Romans chapter 3 verse 24 says, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Redemption looks at sin and says sin is paid for and paid for in full. Verse 25, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation a fully satisfying sacrifice for sin. Jesus Christ paid the price and God the Father says, I'm satisfied. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. God is satisfied with the work of his son. That's good news. That's the basic issues of the gospel. The basic issues of the but now gospel. That the redemption, the Christ's expense and the payment that He made there on Calvary was complete and total. And because the payment was made and the justice was satisfied, now the love and the mercy of God is free to act positively. The same righteousness that condemned the sinner condemned God's Son there on the cross as He was made sin and made a curse. And now the same righteousness being satisfied is free to act in kindness and love toward us because of Calvary. And the, the issue of, of grace, riches at Christ's expense. The expense 
is the payment that Jesus Christ himself made through the shed blood and his finished work there on the cross and his death and his burial and his resurrection. So my title is Grace 101. Grace riches at Christ's expense. Now, is grace, was grace in the Bible for the Apostle Paul? I mean, there's, you see the word occurred a, a few times back in the Old Testament. Grace is in the Bible, and we see it in John chapter number 1. The law came by Moses, but grace came by Jesus Christ. But, the, but Paul doesn't just talk about grace. He says, you know, we're saved by grace and justified freely by His grace. But he has this expression, and the title of my message is Grace Riches, not just grace at Christ, but grace riches. Why is it? So, why does Paul use this expression about the riches and the wealth of God's grace? Grace to a greater degree. Come to the book of Ephesians, chapter number one. Ephesians, chapter number one. I, the, the issue of God's grace. Why does the apostle Paul talk about the riches? And he, he uses this term riches over and over in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter number 1, wonderful verses, basic verses that we're we're all very very familiar with. Ephesians chapter number 1 verse 7, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. That's what we just talked about, the payment that Jesus Christ made, the redemption that's in Christ Jesus, redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to His grace. Is that what he says? He says according to the riches of why does he say why does paul say it's riches of god's grace it comes back to this foundational passage in romans chapter number uh romans chapter three and we're, we're going to get to that in in a couple i'm going to give you a couple reasons why paul uses this term the riches of his grace he says it again in, in ephesians chapter number one and verse 18 when he begins to talk about not just the redemption but our inheritance ephesians chapter one and verse 18 Uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling and what the glory of His inheritance in the saints. No, the riches of His glory. It's not just glory, it's the riches of His glory associated with Paul's gospel. Why does he amplify the issue of God's grace and God's glory? Ephesians chapter number 2. Another phrase about about wealth, Ephesians chapter number 2 and verse 4. But God who is merciful for His great love. No, for for God is rich in mercy. An abundance of mercy associated with this gospel of the grace of God. The the, the goodness of God and the riches of His goodness He talks about in in Romans chapter number 2. But the riches of His mercy... Um, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 7, that in the ages to come he might show the riches of his grace. No, he amplifies it twice. He says the exceeding riches of his grace. This, there's, a, there's a super abounding dimension to, to, the, to the grace of God in this but now gospel. The exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, when he talks about the dispensation of the grace of God, starting in verse 6. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of His promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister. This but now gospel according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of His power. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. This grace, this grace, this exceeding riches of His grace, this this rich in mercy message is unsearchable. The nation of Israel, did they have grace? Peter talks about it. Over in 1 Peter, he talked about the prophets inquiring and searching diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Israel had grace. They had the spirit of grace. and They had, they had the, the, the prophetic, the, the blessings of the Abrahamic covenant. God says He makes an unconditional covenant with Abraham and expands on it with the Palestinian covenant and the Davidic covenant and the new covenant. And all those things were because of Israel's failure under the old covenant. I'm going to give you the land 
Even though you fail under the old covenant, I'm going to make you a great nation even though your kings are going to fail. And I'm going to, make you, I'm going to bless you even though the nation is going to fail with the new covenant. That's grace. Israel didn't deserve it. And, and the, 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 the prophets prophesied of some grace that was going to come to the nation of Israel. But the Apostle Paul uses that same term. He uses it over and over and over again associated with riches and exceeding riches. Why? What makes it, what makes it so super abundant? I'm going to give you two reasons. Why is it grace riches at Christ's expense? Get two passages with me. Get, get the book of Romans chapter number 5. Get Romans chapter number 5. And it comes back to this foundational issue of the, of the but now gospel that's revealed to the Apostle Paul and some of the things that he says in Romans chapter 3. But I want to get two passages because the, the issue of the exceeding riches of His grace is something that is particular to the gospel of the grace of God and the, what is revealed now through the Apostle Paul. Why does Paul talk about grace riches? Because, number one, because of the dispensational setting of the but now gospel. The dispensational setting of the but now gospel. As the Apostle Paul was saved on the road to Damascus, sin had come to a very critical point, hadn't it, in, the, in God's dealings with man. Romans chapter number 5, Romans chapter number 5 and verse number 20. The Apostle Paul says, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. The law didn't stop sin. What did it do? It magnified it. And it, it created a knowledge of sin. And it was, it was, it was the guilt factor was increased because the, by the law is the knowledge of sin and the conviction of sin there. But he, said, he says, The law entered that the offense made abound. That's the old program. But you know the rest of that verse. But where sin abounded, what happened? Grace did much more about. Sin had reached its pinnacle at the, at the point in time in the book of Acts when the nation of Israel had rejected their risen Messiah and the testimony of the Spirit of God through the little flock and its ministry was going on and the nation of Israel said no to the testimony and, and the nation of Israel who killed their Messiah now is rejecting the, the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit in that little flock. And they committed the unpardonable sin there in Acts chapter number 7. And they blasphemed the Holy Spirit. And sin had risen to its height. And Stephen, on the, there he looks up and he sees the Son of God. And he sees Him doing what? Standing on the right hand of God. Why is the Lord Jesus Christ standing? Because in Bible prophecy, what was going to be the response to the events there in early Acts? It was wrath and judgment, Psalm 2. It says that the heathen will be gathered together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. And he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh, and the Lord shall have them in derision. Psalm 2 and verse 5. Then shall he what? Speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. What did the world deserve? before the Apostle Paul was saved on the road to Damascus. They deserved wrath and judgment because they'd crucified the Lord Jesus Christ and they'd rejected the ministry of the Spirit, the nation of Israel, and the Gentiles together in one against the Lord Jesus Christ. Go back, go with me to the book of 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy, when Saul was saved for that wonderful new purpose of revealing the gospel of the grace of God and the dispensation of the grace of God, Paul gives his testimony in, Ephesians, in, in 1 Timothy chapter number 1, verse 13, who before was a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was what? exceeding abundant you know why it was exceeding and abundant because the time had come for the judgment to fall before the prophetic grace was going to be made manifest and the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save not his people <laughs> from their sins he came to do what? Save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy. 
that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. The Apostle Paul talks about the grace of God, but it's not just the grace of God, it's the riches of God's grace, it's the exceeding riches of his grace and the, 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 the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness because at the time when wrath and judgment was ready to fall, God had a wonderful secret. That instead of showing wrath and judgment to a world that deserved the pouring out of the undiluted wrath of God Almighty, there he pours out his undiluted, unmerited, unprophesied grace. And not just grace, but the exceeding riches of his grace. Grace riches, grace riches at Christ's expense. The number one reason why the Apostle Paul talks about grace riches is because of the dispensational setting of the but now gospel. Come back to Romans chapter 3. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. The but now gospel at the point when all the world was guilty before God, at the point when sin had reached its height and and sin had abounded, God's grace did much more abound. Verse 21, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The grace door was hung at Calvary and it was opened up wide to the Gentiles and the exceeding riches of His grace is opened up there. The dispensational setting of the but now gospel is against the backdrop and the magnitude of man's sin and the world's sin. The reason the Apostle Paul calls it grace and the riches of his grace and the exceeding riches is because of the, in contrast to the prophetic setting when the wrath of God and the judgment of God was to fall. We stand at a great point, don't we? Now 2,000 years almost beyond that point, the long-suffering of God and the grace of God and the goodness of God still is appearing to all men, is it not? A great opportunity. Does our world still deserve wrath and judgment? Oh, we get so frustrated. We get so angry with it. We get caught up in the, in the nuts and bolts of what's going on in our world. And yet, the heavens are silent except for a message that goes out of long-suffering and reconciliation offered to a world that long ago deserved wrath and judgment. What a great message. Number one, the dispensational setting of the gospel in contrast to the wrath of God. But number two, the issue here in Romans chapter number uh, 3 and verse 22 Romans chapter number 3 and verse number 22, he says, Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto who? All. And upon all them that believe. Not only is it against the backdrop of of the wrath that should have come, but God's grace is not to his friends. God's grace is not to his people. He's offering grace and goodness and love to how many? To all. He died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. He gave His life a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Not just His people, but the dogs and the uncircumcision and those that were dead in their trespasses and sins. The whole world now has an opportunity. Unrestricted grace, an unrestricted apostleship, an unlimited message because we have an unlimited Savior. That Jesus Christ gave His life a ransom for all to be testified in due time. And now the issue of it's not just His people and it's not just His friends and it's not just His coveted nation, but it's all men everywhere without limitation, without restriction. It's a, it's a, it's a free, uh, it's a revelation and a free offer and an opportunity for the world that deserves wrath and judgment, each and every individual, an unrestricted opportunity to receive abundance of grace. And bless. That's a great message. That's a great message. That's a great message. Thank you. I know I get talking kind of, kind of quick. I'm watching the timer. I'm doing pretty good. 
<laughs> got eight minutes left. We're going we're gonna, to, well, let him, let him that thinketh he stand it take heed lest he fall. Yeah. No, we're going we're to be okay. It's a wonderful message. And the issue of an all-men message, because we have an all-men Savior, is why it's not just grace, but it's exceeding abundant grace because it's available to the world. You're here in the book of Romans. Come to Romans chapter number 11. The issue of an all-men ministry gets to a fundamental issue of the gospel of the grace of God and the nature of of the dispensation of grace. For God to offer grace to all men without distinction, He had to do something first, didn't He? Romans chapter 11 says, Have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles. God had to set the nation of Israel aside temporarily so that He could then offer grace and peace to all. And Romans chapter 11 verse 15 says, For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? The offer is still on the table. The, the, the reconciling of the world is God was in Christ reconciling the world unto Himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them and committed unto us the word of reconciliation. God held back the wrath and now He's at peace with the world. And he's, he's offering them an extension of time to receive His love and His goodness and His mercy through the finished work of Jesus Christ and His ambassadorship, His ambassadors. The, the casting away of them and the reconciling of the world. It's the exceeding riches of God's grace, not just to us, but it's available to the world. Isn't that wonderful? And we live in a day, the nature of the dispensation of grace is one of grace and peace to the world. And as we go forth, we don't have to go forth with anger and resentment and bitterness in our heart because we don't look at individuals now through the, through the flesh. We know no man after the flesh. We look at a sinner as somebody for whom Christ died. And the, 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 the abuse that we take or the frustration that we ex- experience with them, we don't ever have to ask ourselves why, do we? Because we ourselves also were sometimes foolish and disobedient, living in pleasures and, and divers' lusts. We were right where they're at. We have a message to them. We know how to view them because God is at peace. He's offering the world reconciliation because He's set aside the nation of Israel. And you're here in Romans chapter 11. He set the nation of Israel aside. And He says in Romans 11 verse 32, For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that He might have mercy Upon who? All. The riches of God's grace. Grace riches at Christ's expense is the finished work of Jesus Christ provided redemption for believing sinners, but it also opens the door of opportunity to every man, woman, and child on the face of this earth to come to Calvary through the, through the message of, of Christ dying for their sins and was buried and rose again the third day, offering them the free gift of eternal life. That's a wonderful message. And God has now opened up. Romans chapter number 3 and verse 1, the, the details of the cross work. Go back to Romans chapter 3. The, the, the redemption riches, the redemption that's in Christ Jesus, the, the expense, Jesus paid it all. He paid the full price. He satisfied the, the God, God's justice and, and there's a payment available to be applied but through simple faith, Romans chapter 3, back to Romans chapter 3, it's a faith message. It's a faith without works. It's not by the works of the law. In Romans chapter 3, verse 22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all, and it's, but it's upon all them that do what? That believe. The gospel of the grace of God is not a law message, and it's not a works message. It's a faith alone message, is it not? The foundation of grace, grace 101, is that Calvary and and the issue of God's grace is is a faith system, not a performance system. It's not a law system. It's a trusting and resting and believing what God says about the gift of His Son. And it's available to all. It's unto all and it's upon all them that believe. That's the foundation 
of the gospel. It's the foundation of everything else that Paul does. Paul lays that foundational work of the cross and the merits of Calvary and the accomplishments of Calvary before God and makes it known here in the but now gospel in Romans chapter 3. The foundation, that's grace 101. And everything else that Paul teaches from this point on is built on that foundation, is it not? The foundation of Calvary. And we're going to move on into the issues of identification and living the Christian life. But those things are, are basic things. I want to make two points of application in the two minutes and 55 seconds that I have left. <laughs> Number one, I want to reaffirm these foundational issues tonight. Because the issues, the, the grace 101, right division 101, the reconciling of the world and the nature of grace and, and the, the nature of the dispensation of grace is the foundation of all of our ministry and the, the, the edification process and the reconciling of the world, God being at peace. The grace basis system, not a law system, it reaffirms the issue of a clear gospel and a gospel message that we go out with. It's a grace-based system, not a performance-based system. It's a faith-based and not works-based system. We're justified now on the issue of faith and the issue in time past. Paul lays out in Romans chapter 3, verse 25, that the issue has always been the issue of faith without the deeds of the law. Could the deeds of the law ever have a part in somebody else's justification? It's, it's the issue of, of, of justification uh, by faith alone. It affirms the issue of a clear gospel. It's not a turn from your sin gospel. It's not a make your, com your commitment to Christ gospel. It's not a Lord make Jesus the Lord of your life gospel. It's not a just ask Jesus into your heart gospel. What's the gospel? It's a faith alone in Christ alone and His work on the cross alone. It's the, it, it clarifies the issue of the gospel itself. And it settles those issues. The issues of the, of the but now gospel and the status of the world clarifies the beginning of the dispensation of the grace of God because of the nature of what the dispensation of grace is. It clarifies the issue that the body of Christ did not begin on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter number 2. You know why? Because the world hadn't been set aside yet. The world had not been reconciled as far as the, the manifestation of that. The cross work had accomplished, been accomplished, but it hadn't been made known yet. It's still the Abrahamic covenant. God is still dealing with the nation of Israel, is it not? It clarifies that and nails that down and establishes that, that, that the age of grace doesn't begin until salvation goes to the Gentiles through the ministry of the Apostle Paul. It also settles that Acts 28 is too late for the beginning of the dispensation of the grace of God because the no difference message and the mystery and the grace message had gone on long before Acts chapter number 28 and Israel had been reconciled and, and there was no difference and it's recorded in, in uh, Paul's Acts epistles. It also, reaffirming these foundational issues, settles the issue of Calvinism and its limited atonement message because Jesus Christ died for how many? For all, and all means all. <laughs> okay. He died for all. We're almost done. And all needed it. It does in the issue of Calvinism and its limited atonement. It does in the issue of unconditional election because it's a legitimate offer to all, not just a select few. Because he says in Romans chapter number 3, by faith of Jesus Christ unto all. That's a legitimate offer. God isn't saying all, but I only mean some. <laughs> it does death to that system of Calvinism. Something else that it also settles, and I've had conversations and, and correspondence in recent days with an old issue of the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. And this issue of the reconciling of the world and the, nation, the, the nature of the age of grace when you understand that it's unto all, it's a no, different, no difference message, and it's uh, the nation of Israel has been set aside to extend the dispensation of grace into that 70th week violates the foundational issues of there being no difference between Jew and Gentile and everybody's on the same level because in that 70th week, is God dealing with Israel again? 
He surely is. And, he's, and the, the issue of his chastening wrath and, and the law program is back in, in place because that fifth course of judgment is now beginning to be, to be reinstituted and Israel is going to be gathered together and purged and, 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 and purified to go into that kingdom. And the body of Christ has no place there on the earth as ambassadors of grace and peace to a, to a world that God is now dealing once again with the nation of Israel. To extend the age of grace into the 70th week is to violate the basic nature of the dispensation of grace itself in the foundation that he lays in Romans 3. Amen? Amen. And, and so we understand some of those things. The foundation that we have in this wonderful gospel account here in Romans 3 is the, is, is the nuts and bolts of everything else that Paul builds on. And it's Grace 101. I'd like to finish with just a renewed opportunity for ministry. You know, we've, the issue of justification by faith, and uh, it's been mentioned two or three times about those that have gone on before. We just sang the, the great song, um, he hideth my soul, Mel Derry. There's a whole list that a lot of folks, a lot of people that, 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 that have been with us through the years that are no longer here. Ralph Balog and, and Eldon Davis and, and Brother Daryl Mefford and now um, Doug Dodd and, and on and on. Now Ray Watson, more recent. One person that comes to mind as we think about the foundational issues here and the basic issues of, of life and ministry and service for the Lord is Brother Oscar Woodall. He had a tremendous impact in my life, and, and I know many of yours as well. Woody had a way of, of uh, when he would come around, he'd always ask you, you know, how long has it been since you shared the gospel with somebody? Has it been a week, two weeks, been a month? You know, and you know, you'd kind of, you know, hi, Woody, how you doing? You know, <laughs> he had a way of, of reminding us of the accountability factor and the responsibility factor of getting back to the issue of the Christian life and the grace life 101, what's God's will is that all men be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. And we do. We press the issue of right to vision and getting the message of grace out and, and, and trying to convince the, uh, or, or to, to minister to a confused and a divided church. You're looking for the term churchianity. I like that church, Christendom, whatever you want to call it. And we do that, but there's no substitute for personal evangelistic work and sharing the gospel. And renewing that commitment to each of us as individuals. I, I, I talk and I, I talk about myself and or in, in thinking about that issue myself, I have a long way to be challenged by that. But you know, doing personal work is one of the greatest ways to renew your mind and renew your life and joy in your life, in your Christian service. One quick example. I have a, I'm self-employed and have a, have a window cleaning business, and I have a customer that I've had for, for years. Runs a little auto repair shop. And I come and go once a month and, uh, and clean his windows. And, and uh, the last time I did his windows, I, I apologize. I said, I said I'll, say, I'll say his name, Dan. I said, Dan, I missed you last month. I'm sorry. Got rained out. And he said, Ted? I forgive you. It's okay. It's good to have forgiveness. And I, I said, oh boy. I got, you know, it, it is great to have forgiveness, Dan. It's great to have forgiveness and to know that we have a Savior that died on the cross and was buried and rose again the third day for our, for our eternal life. And, and you know, just, just shared that little, that little expression with him. But, you know, I'm running late. And I just said, I said Dan, you know, it's, uh, you know, thanks for forgiving me, but... You know, God's forgiven me too. I hope you, I hope you know the forgiveness that's ours in Christ Jesus. And, when I, and I, started, I started going on down the, the side of the building and, and he followed me. You know, and I'm running late and I'm in a hurry because I got things I want to do at the end of the day. And, I, and, and he's following me and he started talking and, and I thought, well, wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> you go beyond just the thinking about the, the, the schedules and the, the duties and the responsibilities of the day. And he just wanted to talk. So I asked him some about his church background, and, and he says, what do you think about somebody who goes to church, or who doesn't go to church but believes? I says, people have been messed up by going to church for a long time. <laughs> but began to talk to him about the issue of the gospel, and he listened. And as, as we talked about you know, his background, he was a denominational background and had been burned in different... I says, I says, 
the church and, and, and Christianity and Jesus Christ, it's not just a historical fact. It's life in Christ Jesus. It's something that was done for you. For you personally to rejoice in and rest in salvation is a free gift. And uh, what a privilege that was. Then the phone rang. <laughs> and then he had to go and, and take care of some things. And, and I didn't get the chance to follow up the conversation because he's still talking on the phone to a customer. But you know what? After I did that, you know what the rest of my day was like? <laughs> I was just on top of the world. Getting involved with people. Thinking about people. Being prepared to share the gospel. It was mentioned earlier about having tracks in your pocket. I can't carry tracks in my pocket because they get all sweaty. You know, they get more than dog-eared and bent and curled, you know, because I'm especially working in the summertime. But I've got a packet of tracks in my car. I've got a little, a little, a little pouch with, with gospel tracks and Bible study tracks. And, and I was able to go out the door and I gave him a, oh, that little total forgiveness track and the church brochure. And I says, here's something that's written. It's not written by Dr. So-and-so. It's written by me. It's a, it's a gospel track. He says, oh, it's written by Dr. Ted. <laughs> but it meant some. You know, Brother Woody challenged me to write my own track my own personal testimony of how I got saved or, or other issues. You know, when you're dealing with people, to share on a personal level with them is, I mean, share, any, share a gospel track, but, but a personal track, your own personal testimony, something that you wrote from your heart to theirs, be a tremendous, that'll rejuvenate your life. It'll renew your mind and your commitment to some of the basic things of the gospel. You know, you might not have, you might not carry them in your pocket, but you ought to have a stack of tracks in your desk at work or in your locker at school or in your toolbox or wherever it is you, you're out throughout the day. You ought to be thinking about your life day in and day out and praying for the people that you're going to interact with on a regular basis and looking for opportunities to talk to people about the Lord on just the basic level of the gospel because that's, the found, that's grace 101, isn't it? You know, we, we look at these nuts and bolts things about and the foundational issues, and they're so very important. But ultimately, getting down in the trenches and dealing with lost people about their souls is uh, one of the greatest ways to renew your hope and to renew your mind in the issue of the things of the Lord. Amen? Amen. So let's, as we, as we soar into the heavenly places, let's remember that we also have a ministry and a, and a responsibility as we go out to share the gospel one-on-one. -on -one. These foundational issues, Grace 101, is getting to meet somebody on the level where they're at and the issue of their soul. Aren't you glad somebody did with you? And you're here, the gospel works, doesn't it? Grace 101, Calvary. What a wonderful message. If you're here this evening and you don't know the Lord as your personal Savior, the issue of, of knowing for sure that your sins are forgiven and heaven is your eternal home, can be settled by a personal, individual decision in your heart to rest in the provision that God has made for you at Calvary. And uh, don't leave this evening without settling that issue uh, first and foremost in your heart. Talk to somebody before you leave. But in the privacy and quietness of your own heart, you can just look and say, I'm the sinner for whom Christ died. Jesus paid it all. I can't do enough. I can't do it right. But... You're sat God, God, you're satisfied with the work of your son. I'll trust the provision that you've made for you, for me. And you'll pass from death unto life and receive the free gift of eternal life. What a great message we have. I hope you've, we've all done that. Father, we thank you for your goodness and grace. We thank you for the basics of Calvary, of redemption and, and propitiation and having the righteousness imputed to us and forgiveness and, and sin not imputed. We thank you for the riches of your grace that that we experience individually. We thank you for the offer of grace to a world that 2,000 years ago rejected your son, to a nation that said no and said, we'll not have this man to reign over us. What a great privilege we have as ambassadors of grace and peace to share the, the, the simple message of salvation. May we do so. May we shine as lights in a dark world and let the light of the Lord Jesus Christ shine in our lives through the message and the living in us and the person of our Savior living in us day by day, moment by moment. We thank you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.